can I uh, begin by welcoming you to this session concerning the Court of Appeal's very recent uh, decision in the case of Maguire. We're lucky enough to have two um, expert uh, inquest practitioners with us today, um, Emma from Chambers and Sarah from um, DLA Piper, to talk us through the issues. Uh, before they do so, however, um, I would like to draw your attention to the fact that Chambers publishes um, a newsletter that specifically relates to inquests and inquiries. The next edition comes out uh, next week. It's packed with useful material for those that work in this area. There are some case updates, um, some really useful in-depth analyses of the way that the law is moving. If you didn't check the box and opt into marketing material when signing up to this webinar, don't worry. If you email uh, George Connor, from whom the invitation to this event was um, sent to you, saying you would like to really receive the inquest and inquiries newsletter, she will ensure that you get it. And whilst on um, parish notices, I should say that we would like you to use the chat function um, to ask questions in the course of the session. We will answer them or at least attempt to answer them uh, at the end of the session. So turning to Maguire, uh, the first issue is why does the engagement or non-engagement of Article 2 uh, matter at all in practice? I think the first thing to point out is that um, whether Article 2 is engaged or not doesn't make uh, much difference to the running of the inquest in our experience up until the point of uh, conclusions and determinations at the end of it. And so I think our collective experience is that Article 2 decisions don't affect or affect very little uh, the scope of the inquest, which witnesses are to be called, including whether expert witnesses are to be called, what disclosure is given, or whether there is or is not a jury. I should say um, that an early determination of Article 2 is obviously very helpful from the family's perspective as it increases greatly the chances of securing legal aid. But the Article 2 issue is very important to the conclusions and determinations that can be returned at the end of the inquest. In particular, if the extended investigative obligation applies, firstly, the court can return an extended narrative conclusion. Secondly, um, a weakened causation test applies because of the case of Lewis. So something that was possibly causative of death can be included in the narrative, which opens up a, a vista of possibilities for a coroner or a jury writing their narrative. And lastly, and perhaps most importantly, when you're acting um, for a body or an organization or the state that may have done something wrong, a narrative conclusion can include judgmental language, language that's indicative of fault or wrongdoing. Now, the Court of Appeal in Maguire had three uh, routes down which it uh, could have gone in resolving the question. It could have applied a test of whether the risk to Jackie's life was real and immediate, the Osmond test, and said that's the vehicle, that's the architecture around which we're going to decide issues or it could have applied an automatic approach, a bit like some custody cases, uh, where just the mere fact that somebody was in custody or here um, under a dole's, their liberty uh, restricted, uh, automatically means Article 2 applies. Or they could have treated it as a medical case and gone down the Fernandez line of authorities that we're going to hear about. Now the court, um, as we'll find out, took largely that latter approach. And so subject to anything that the Supremes may have to say uh, about the issue, that's the law. With that introduction, can I turn over to Sarah? Thank you, Jason, and good afternoon, everybody. I'm just going to um, try and give you a fairly brief um, summary of the facts in this case uh, before we turn to the legal implications. So th the facts are that Jackie Maguire, uh, was 52 years old when she very sadly died in hospital on the 22nd of February 2017. The medical cause of death was a perforated gastric ulcer and peritonitis and pneumonia 
Jackie had lived since 1993 in a residential care home run by a charity and paid for by the local council. She had Down syndrome and other learning disabilities. Jackie had been subject to a standard authorization pursuant to the deprivation of liberty safeguards or DOLS as set out in the Mental Capacity Act 2005. Now there was evidence that Jackie had in the past refused blood tests when she she had been ill and she had been sedated in order that she could be taken to hospitals in the past for a blood test. In the days leading up to Jackie's death, she had been unwell and there had been a series of failings in relation to her healthcare treatment. So firstly, care home staff had failed to act on Jackie's own request to see a doctor on the 16th of February 2017 and then again in the morning of the 21st of February 2017, after she had been unwell, which included having diarrhoea and vomiting. Jackie had what was described as a fit late that day on the 21st of February, and the GP surgery was called, but the care home staff were told to phone NHS 111 instead. NHS 111 told the care home staff to call the GP surgery, so they were called again and they said a GP would attend, GP called the care home just over an hour later and on reviewing medical records prescribed anti-sickness tablets and an antibiotic for a UTI. After Jackie collapsed that evening NHS 111 was called again and they sent an ambulance. The ambulance crew were not made aware in advance that Jackie had learning disabilities um, on, and on arrival they weren't provided with a complete or full um, history of, of Jackie's recent medical condition that day. The care home staff, the ambulance crew and Jackie's mother all agreed that Jackie should go to hospital. But Jackie refused and the paramedics were not prepared to sedate her as Jackie's mother had suggested she should be. It was advised that Jackie should be monitored overnight, which she was. In the morning, Jackie had a further seizure and she was taken in an ambulance to hospital where she sadly died that evening. So that, that's the summary of the facts. Um, so I'll just take you now through the procedural background to this and, and briefly explain how the case ended up in the Court of Appeal. So the inquest into Jackie's death took place in June 2018. Throughout the inquest hearing, the coroner had proceeded on the basis that Article 2 of the European Convention on Human Rights was engaged. However, at the conclusion of the inquest and prior to summing up and sending out the jury, the coroner decided that in light of the decision of the High Court in the case of Parkinson, Article 2 was not engaged and that was based on his assessment of the evidence he had heard. So Jackie's family challenged this decision by way of judicial review. So in the divisional court, um, it was found that there hadn't been systemic failings, only failings of an individual nature. There was general agreement that Jackie was extremely vulnerable. She was not permitted to leave the care home unaccompanied. She was completely dependent on the assistance of others. The touchstone for state responsibility was said to be either systemic dysfunction arising from a regulatory failure or a relevant assumption of responsibility. And it was held by the divisional court that where Jackie was not actually imprisoned or detained, whether there was a sufficient assumption of responsibility was a matter for the coroner and the court would not interfere in the absence of him making some legal error or reaching an irrational decision, which it concluded that he had not. So the Maguire family then appealed to the Court of Appeal. And at the Court of Appeal, there were three grounds. The first was that the Divisional Court erred in concluding that the procedural obligation under Article 2 of the European Convention on Human Rights did not apply. By parity of reasoning with the, of reasoning with the case of Rabone, the circumstances of Jackie's care dictated that the procedural obligation applied. It was not a medical case of the sort considered in Parkinson. Ground two was that if that was wrong and Parkinson did apply, the divisional court was wrong to conclude that the failure to have in place a system for admitting Jackie to hospital on the evening of the 21st of February did not amount to a systemic failure. And finally, ground three was that the divisional court erred in failing to take account of the wider context of premature deaths of people with learning disabilities, such information being known to the senior coroner at the time, even if not in evidence before him, but in any event being relevant to the application of Article 2 in these circumstances. So with that in mind, I'm going to now pass you over to Emma, who's going to give you a quick reminder of the basics of Article 2. Thank you, Emma. 
Thank you, Sarah. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to deal with the Court of Appeal's discussion and conclusions in respect of ground one of the appeal, and Sarah will deal with grounds two and three. Before we turn to this, though, and at risk of uh, teaching grandmothers to suck eggs, I'm going to go back to basics with a short reminder of the procedural and substantive Article 2 obligations and the role that inquests play in respect of the former. The procedural obligation under Article 2 requires the state to initiate an investigation into a death for which it may bear responsibility. Ordinarily, an inquest will be the vehicle by which the procedural obligation is discharged. Where the procedural obligation arises, the coroner conducting the inquest is required to return or allow the jury to return an expanded conclusion in accordance with Section 5.2 of the Coroners and Justice Act 2009, which determines not just how the deceased came by his or her death, but how and also in what circumstances. So how does the coroner decide whether the procedural obligation is engaged in relation to any given death? It will be engaged only in circumstances where there is evidence to substantiate at least an arguable breach of the substantive obligations under Article 2. The substantive obligations comprise two elements, a negative and a positive obligation, with the positive obligation itself having two sub-elements. The negative obligation is to refrain from taking life, save in the exceptional circumstances described in Article 2.2. The positive obligation is to take appropriate steps to safeguard the lives of those within its jurisdiction. This encompasses, first, in certain well-defined circumstances, an operational duty to protect an identified individual to whom a responsibility is owed or assumed from a real and immediate risk to life, from the criminal acts of a third party or themselves. And second, a general duty to put in place laws and procedures which safeguard the lives of citizens generally. This has been described as a duty to put in place a legislative and administrative framework designed to provide effective deterrence against threats to the right to life. Deaths in certain situations automatically engage the procedural Article 2 obligation because the situations of themselves raise an issue as to whether the state has breached either the negative obligation or the positive obligation. So deliberate killings by state agents and violent or suspicious deaths, including self-inflicted deaths in state custody or state detention. In other cases, the question will be whether the coroner considers that the evidence available following a preliminary investigation discloses a possibility that the state has not com complied with a substantive Article 2 obligation. So after that whistle-stop tour of the basic applicable principles, it is back to Maguire and the Court of Appeal's discussion and conclusion in relation to ground one of the appeal. Under ground one, the appellant argued that Jackie's case was not a medical case of the sort governed by Parkinson. The case was more akin to that of Rabone, the, Re the Supreme Court decision in which it was held that the positive obligation owed to those receiving psychiatric treatment in hospital, which resulted from mental illness that gave rise to a risk of suicide, was owed to voluntary patients as well as involuntary patients. Before turning to discussion and conclusions, the Court of Appeal analysed the relevant European and domestic jurisprudence under two headings, medical cases and medical deaths in custody. At paragraphs 22 to 26 of the judgment, the Court of Appeal restated the approach adopted by the European Court in Lopez de Souza Fernandez and Portugal in cases involving alleged medical negligence. In such cases, the state's positive obligations are regulatory, including necessary measures to ensure implementation, including supervision and enforcement. It would only be in very exceptional circumstances that the state's responsibility under the substantive limb of Article 2 might be engaged. 
On the question of medical deaths in custody, the Court of Appeal considered the divisional court decision in Tyrell. Lord Burnett made the following observation in relation to his own judgment in that case. The Osman operational duty on prison authorities extends to medical care provided within custodial institutions in the way discussed in Tyrell and in securing outside medical treatment in a timely way when it is needed. The approach to alleged medical negligence or mishap by outside medical professionals to which a prisoner has been appropriately referred would be no different from the ordinary approach in such cases. If the facts in Tyrell had included a suggestion that the NHS hospital had treated the cancer negligently, the operational duty would not have arisen, save to the extent that the cumulative tests now found in Lopez de Souza were satisfied. The Court of Appeal in Maguire did not accept the appellant's underlying argument that the undeniable vulnerability of an individual in Jackie's position coupled with the fact of a doll's authorization, dictated that she was owed an Article 2 operational duty. Instead, the court stressed the importance of focusing on the scope of any such duty and why it might be owed. The question whether an operational duty under Article 2 was owed to Jackie was not an abstract one which delivers a yes or no answer in all circumstances. The operational duty is owed to vulnerable people under the care of the state for some purposes. But the authorities did not support a conclusion that for all purposes an operational duty is owed to those in a vulnerable position in care homes, which then spawns the distinct procedural obligation with all its components in the event of a death which follows either alleged failures or inadequate interventions by medical professionals. Lord Burnett noted that the argument advanced before the coroner, the divisional court and the court of appeal was largely structured around a binary question. Is this a Rabone case or a Parkinson case? That, however, was not the approach of the Strasbourg court. The fact that an operational duty to protect life exists does not lead to the conclusion that for all purposes, the death of a person owed that duty is to be judged by Article 2 standards. The Court of Appeal was assisted in considering Jackie's circumstances by the decision of the fifth section of the Strasbourg Court from October 2018, the case of Dumper and Latvia. The applicant's son in that case, who had Down syndrome and epilepsy, had been in long-term state care since he was 16. The allegations in that case were of failure by health professionals in the care home and the GP who had last seen the applicant's son to provide him with adequate medical assistance. The court, in finding that Article 2 was not engaged, distinguished the facts from those cases where the domestic authorities had been aware of appalling conditions that later led to the deaths of young people placed in social care homes or hospitals and had unreasonably put the lives of those people in danger. In contrast, the complaints made by the applicant and Dumper were complaints pertaining to medical negligence in the care provided to her son, and the case did not fall within the exceptional circumstances set out in Lopez de Souza. The Court of Appeal in Maguire held that the coroner was right to conclude that on the evidence adduced at the inquest, there was no basis for believing that Jackie's death was the result of a breach of the operational duty of the state to protect life. Jackie's circumstances were not analogous with a psychiatric patient who is in hospital to guard against the risk of suicide. She was resident in a care home because she was unable to look after herself and it was not possible for her to live with her family. She was not there for medical treatment, and if she needed medical treatment, it was sought in the usual way from the NHS. Sarah, I will turn over to you now to deal with grounds two and three of the appeal. Thanks, Emma. So ground two, just quickly by way of reminder, was that um, if Parkinson did apply, the divisional court was wrong to conclude that the failure to have in place a system for admitting Jackie to hospital on the evening 
of the 21st of February did not amount to a systemic failure. So Parkinson was the High Court decision which came out just a few days before the Maguire inquest started. Um, and Parkinson is clearly a medical case. It does not involve the death of an individual who was um, detained or otherwise cared for by the state. It was a case involving alleged neg medical negligence. The Maguire judgment itself does not deal with the facts or findings of Parkinson in any real detail, other than by way of reference to the um, Strasbourg case of Lopez de Souza, which Emma has, has just mentioned. Lopez de Souza is the authority that governs cases which can be characterized as medical negligence cases, such as Parkinson. And the European Court in Lopez de Souza, de Souza defined the very exceptional circumstances which would elevate an ordinary medical negligence case to a case which can give rise to a breach of the operational duty. So these two very exceptional circumstances were defined by the court as consisting of two types. The first type is where an individual patient's life is knowingly put in danger by denial of access to life-saving emergency treatment. And the second type is where a systemic or structural dysfunction in hospital services results in a patient being deprived of access to life-saving treatment. And the authorities knew or ought to have known about the risk and failed to undertake the necessary measures to prevent the risk from materializing, thus putting patients' lives, including the life of the particular patient, in danger. So in Parkinson, it was decided by the divisional court that the death in an A&E department of a 91-year-old lady did not invoke Article 2. The deceased son had been unhappy with the A&E doctor's decision that Mrs. Parkinson was dying, and there was no useful treatment that, that she could be given. Mrs. Parkinson's son objected then at the time, but still the doctor refused to treat her. The coroner at the inquest found that there had, had not been any failure to diagnose or treat Mrs. Parkinson, and the coroner concluded that the death had been caused by natural causes and any addition, additional treatment would have been ineffective. Mrs. Parkinson's son believed that Article 2 applied and the divisional court firmly ruled that it did not. It directly applied the case of Lopez de Souza and it slammed the door shut on arguments that there are any systemic failures which engage Article 2 in anything other than the most exceptional of cases, which this was not. The Court of Appeal in Maguire concluded that there was nothing in the materials before it which suggests that there is a widespread difficulty in taking individuals with learning disabilities or elderly dementia patients to hospital when it is in their interest to do so. The criticism of the care home, the paramedics and the out of hours GP is that between them they failed to get Jackie to hospital on the evening of the 21st of February and that a plan, a protocol or some guidance should have been in place that would have achieved that end. The court went on to conclude that this was remote from the sort of systemic regulatory failing which the Strasbourg uh, court has in mind as underpinning the very exceptional circumstances in which a breach of the operational duty to protect life might be found in a medical case. And so the Maguire family was also unsuccessful on ground too, that this was an exceptional medical case which amounted to systemic failure. So finally, moving on to ground three. Ground three was as follows, that the divisional court erred in failing to take account of the wider context of premature deaths of people with learning disabilities, such information being known to the senior coroner at the time, even if not in evidence before him, but in any event being relevant to the application of Article 2 in these circumstances. In its judgment, the Court of Appeal considered the 2017 annual report of the Bristol Fry Centre for Disability Studies entitled the Learning Disabilities Mortality Review. This was said to support the contention that an operational duty was owed to Jackie in connection with the medical attention she received up to her death. The court briefly considered the evidence from this report, which showed an overall li lower life expectancy for people with, down with, with learning disabilities. Sorry. And the court noted that this evidence related to deaths of those in any environment and not just care homes. And, and these were the court's conclusions. Unsurprisingly, these reports were not in evidence because they do not illuminate how, when or where Jackie came by her death, nor even in what circumstances she came by her death. 
These reports, and in particular the continuing work of Bristol University, have made a valuable contribution to an understanding of the complex issues underlying why those with learning disabilities have reduced life expectancy. In our view, they do not provide additional weight to the argument that a relevant operational duty was owed to Jackie. So the family also failed on ground three and therefore failed overall in this appeal. So that concludes our summary of the facts and the law, which was considered in the judgment. And so in terms of the implications of this judgment, I'm going to pass over to Jason and Emma again um, to consider with me what these implications might be and whether or not this case or others like it might be considered differently by the Supreme Court. So my question uh, to start off the discussion um, is this, could evidence of systemic failures in the provision of care and healthcare for people with learning disabilities play a role in tipping the balance in favor of finding either that exceptional circumstances apply or that a substantive duty is owed for the purposes of article two? Thanks, Sarah. Um, I'll have a crack, if you don't mind, um, first, Emma, at answering that question. And overall, I think the answer is it could do. And one shouldn't see uh, Maguire as shutting the door. Um, I, I think one's got to bring into account the way in which matters unfolded in Maguire, which was that the material, the Bristol study, the Sippold study, and others like it, which focus on the difficulties, amongst other things, that people with learning disabilities have in accessing medical care, um, weren't in evidence before the coroner. And not only that, there wasn't an attempt at the inquest itself to link the um, generic systemic findings of those studies with what had happened to Jackie in this case. And so the way that the inquest was run um, didn't lend itself subsequently to bring into account those Sippold uh, studies and the Bristol study. So the first time they emerged was after the inquest had been concluded um, in the judicial review itself. They were put in the bundle by um, the claimant and said, essentially, well, there's another thing. Um, it, um, it is the case that there are a, there is a wider concern about the care that those um, in care homes receive, in particular in accessing medical attention. So it was very much a, or it appeared to be very much an afterthought. Um, and I wouldn't say the result would be the same if um, a team or an advocate set out with the very intention of um, through the evidence and in particular through expert evidence trying to draw a link between systemic fault that has been identified at a national level and what went on on this occasion with this deceased person in their care home. So um, anyone else uh, would like to chip in then please do so. Um, I, I entirely agree Jason, uh, it, it could um, but there would have to be certain things uh, that were achieved by those kind of statistics or studies. Um, and the first one would be that link that you've already talked about. Um, not just that there is evidence of a systemic problem for people with learning difficulties, but also that um, the particular facts of that case related to it. Um, but also we've got to think about um, the state responsibility aspect of this. And so I can see um, a case in which the statistics relating to specific problems, systemic problems for those with learning difficulties who were resident in care homes as opposed to those in the community. And um, those kind of statistics in a case where someone was a resident in a care home and had circumstances similar to Jackie's. Um, that might be um, a way of drawing um, attention to the particular problems that might arise in care homes. As far as I'm aware, there's no evidence base for that kind of specific study, um, drawing a distinction between community and um, care homes. Um, so we've got to think as well about how those would relate to the state responsibility aspect of it, I think. I also, I also wonder how that, that question about 
about the evidence and the evidence that was considered in the Court of Appeal in this case, um, whether or not that would also speak to um, any known risk arguments, because I think the, the, the ground one that Emma discussed, um, you know, sort of dis dismisses the, the operational duty being owed. And one of the sort of conclusions is that um, you know, Jackie was not in that home for medical treatment. And if she needed medical treatment, it was sought in the usual way from the NHS. Of course, some of those studies point to the suggestion that, that there is a, a clear risk that someone cannot seek medical treatment in the usual way from the NHS when they're in a care home because of problems with communication, um, understanding, a lack of reasonable adjustment. So as well as being relevant to, um, to, to the assumption of responsibility, I wonder if, if it could also be argued as to be relevant to that um, known, known risk. Yeah, that's a, certainly a second way I think that um, it could have been, but um, wasn't um, in the event deployed. Broadening the, um, the debate out a little bit, or the discussion out a, a little bit, um, and going back to almost where we began, um, why does it matter? Why does Article 2 matter so much? Um, I wonder whether either of you have got a view on what the implications are for um, care homes, in particular, given the statistics that um, we're regularly reminded of, of the appalling number of people that have died um, in care homes having tested positive um, for COVID, uh, and whether the, um, uh, the decision has a particular impact or potentially an impact on inquests into those deaths, putting aside the guidance notes that the coroner, the chief coroner has issued. I think it's quite likely that the majority of COVID-19 deaths of care home residents will be non-Article 2 um, as a result of this judgment. Um, and the reality is that where a, a care home has sought medical attention and followed advice, those cases are likely to fall into the same kind of category as Jackie's case. Um, and so that is, I suppose, the start point. And it's then a question of working out what might change that um, and which type of those cases uh, might be straying into Article 2 territory. Um, but I, I think that the immediate implication is that the majority of those deaths are likely to be non-Article 2. Yeah, I, I agree with, with Emma that based on this decision, you can see how it will be more likely that the coroner would uh, decide not that Article 2 isn't engaged. Um, I suppose the, the only thing that, again, the, the, same, the same argument might be made that um, there is emerging evidence, I think it's in the early stages, that people in care homes with learning disabilities have been worse, you know, more badly affected and the death rates have been higher um, than for, for people without learning disabilities and not in care homes. So again, I wonder if that speaks to a, a, a known risk um, that, that those people will be worse, you know, worse affected and that whether or not that could lead to to a, to an argument, a successful argument potentially that Article Two should apply. The problem, I suppose, with that is that it wasn't really known. Um, it's been unfolding and uh, and developing, and therefore one, um, unlike the Bristol study or the Sipold study, which were, I think, respectively, 2013 and December 2017, so predated by a good margin. Um, the, the relevant circumstances in Jackie's case, it, um, it isn't a fixed position. Um, it, it's been very, uh, the evidence has been variable and um, I think slow to emerge in a definitive way. So I think that would be a harder hill to climb, I suspect. I mean, from your perspective, Sarah, I know that you um, look after the interest of a number of family groups um, in, in inquest. What's the um, what's the position in relation to the importance of Article 2 being engaged or being held to be engaged at an early stage in the inquest process and um, funding? Yeah, um, from, I mean, from, from my experience when I've, when I've acted for families in inquests, um, obviously 
one of the major practical implications is the fact that until you, the coroner agrees that, that, that Article 2 is engaged, um, it's very, very difficult to get funding. Um, and sometimes the coroner might decide that Article 2 is engaged, but only at the end of an inquest. Um, so that means that the families had to, um, to sort of fight that battle on the side as the inquest is ongoing. Um, so it, obviously there's a huge practical uh, reason why it's important for, for families that an, art, that an inquest is deemed an Article 2 one early on. Um, and I think the second one, you know, anybody that's been involved in an inquest will know that, that whatever the sort of legal reason why Article 2 is or isn't important, because you know, as, as you said in your introduction, um, it, it doesn't make, always make a huge difference. It doesn't make a huge difference to the scope of the inquest. Um, but it does make a huge difference um, to families in terms of this being their, what they see anyway, as their one opportunity to find out what happened um, and to find out who was responsible. And so families are often fighting for an, art, an inquest to be designated an Article 2 inquest because um, they know that that will mean there is a greater likelihood that the conclusion um, that, that comes out of that inquest will, will expand on um, potential failings of care home staff or medical professionals. Um, so for them, that's an important purpose that an inquest serves. Okay, we've, um, uh, we've had a number of questions in. I wish I hadn't have asked the question now. The, um, uh, <laughs> it's a bit like exam time. So the, the first uh, one, uh, thanks Holly, genuinely, thank you, it is what could be done to um, bring um, the um, leader study and the mortality review, that's the Lipold study, um, into inquests and if there's no work or communication going on between the programs and coroners how could that be facilitated um, I'll have a crack at, um, at answering that but I think the answer to the first part of the question is um, speaking for myself I think a coroner would sit up and take notice um, and one is more likely to be able to make more of um, generic material um, if it is introduced through an expert. And so I would have thought the key would be to um, it, uh, seek to persuade the coroner to commission an expert report, or um, if um, one is for a, um, a PIP who um, wants to go down this route um, and funding's available, um, commission an expert report that seeks to draw a link between the general and the specific. I think that's the way to um, bring the material um, before the court. And um, if there is a link or if there isn't a link, then the expert um, will, will say so. So get in very early on the instruction of an expert and seek to influence the content of the material that the expert sees and the questions that the expert is asked. As for the, um, the, the second part of the question, if there's no um, work or communication going on between the program and um, UK coroners. How can it be um, facilitated? That's harder for me um, to answer. Certainly the coroner in this case who I acted for was very aware of um, both studies and was in active um, and frequent correspondence with them. That's how the Divisional Court and then the Court of Appeal was able to make the finding that the coroner was aware of the studies. Indeed, he provided information on Jackie's case to the studies to inform their further work. So I would say it's probably a mixture of um, uh, petitioning through the chief coroner uh, to raise awareness um, of the importance of the provision of information back from um, the coronial jurisdiction uh, to the studies um, and uh, persuasion of local coroners if you happen to deal with a case involving a person in care who suffers from learning disabilities. Um, anyone um, else wish to add uh, to those answers? No, I think you've covered that very well. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> thanks, gold star for me then. Um, <laughs> uh, further question, thanks um, Gemma. Um, in supported living um, with uh, dolls in place, um, people with learning disabilities have not been able to access COVID testing. Um, could this um, uh, lead Article 2 to be engaged? 
if the person um, subsequently died of, um, of uh, COVID. Um, th there's all sorts of, um, I think, problems with that analysis. Um, firstly, drawing a, um, a causative link between the absence of a COVID test and the subsequent um, acquiring of COVID. And then secondly, the, the second bit of the question, actually proving um, a link given the nature of the post-mortem examinations that are going on now um, between uh, the presence of COVID and um, death. Um, for the most part, I think our statistics are made up of people um, who died uh, whilst um, having COVID, but rather than statistics made up of people who died of COVID. Um, and I think that's reflective of the way that death certificates are being completed at the moment. Um, so I, I, at the moment, I would see difficulties in maintaining that argument. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I mean, um, I suppose Gemma's question is, is sort of linked to the, the, the question that I was raising a moment ago um, and then linking this to COVID in general. Um, you know, the, the situation where someone's not been able to access COVID testing um, in an inquest that that would be similar to, to what happened in Maguire in the sense that you know somebody with a learning disability um, is dependent on their carers so um, you know there needs to be a system in place for those carers to help them access medical treatment um, and if that's not there then yes of course there'll be arguments raised by families in these situations that 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 is an article two um, issue or breach but um, as Jason says, and, and based on this case of Maguire, it, well, as Jason says, for a lot of reasons, practical reasons around COVID in general, and also based on this case of Maguire, I, I think it, it's, yeah, it's unlikely. And I think um, a point that um, Jason's already touched on is uh, the, the degree of hindsight which we have on uh, now in respect of uh, the early stages when COVID-19 was emerging and the situation was emerging. Um, I, I, you know, and I, I think that certainly the Chief Coroner's guidance uh, is pushing towards being careful before seeing uh, these cases as being potentially Article 2 and, the, and the, the guidance seems to be in the majority of cases they won't be. Um, there's an interesting point raised in the chat box um, by one of our attendees about the the issue of discharge of patient, patients from hospital who turned out to be COVID-19 positive into care homes and, uh, the, and outbreaks that may or may not have happened as a result of that it, within the care home. Um, and perhaps that's a, you know, an example of um, uh, one of those cases where it really will depend on the facts as to whether um, that was something that was obviously could have been avoided whether it was an active policy um, or whether it was something um, that uh, you know, was a result of uh, the emergency and the lack of time to be thinking about these things and a lack of an awareness. Um, so I think there's going to be a, a real exercise in deciding what could have been done at the time, at looking at it from a reasonable position at the time rather than with hindsight. Thank you. Um, if we can move to Carl's question then. Um, Carl asked, um, as the court approached Maguire as a medical case, do we think that, that the judgment should have um, any or will have any impact on how practitioners should consider and how coroners will consider the three criteria set out in Rabone for cases that focus more on psychiatric care alongside physical medical care? The temptation is to say, no, it won't, that everything's in these... Um, at silos, uh, these hermetically sealed boxes, and that um, one um, approaches Maguire on the case that it applies and only applies to um, uh, medical cases. Um, and um, medical in this context means, um, as you say, physical care, not psychiatric care. But I don't think that's what the court intended, and I don't think the language that it used um, leads one to that conclusion. So I think it, um, it could have an impact, a significant impact, on the way that um, coroners are asked to and the way that they do um, approach uh, psychiatric cases as well. But the whole essence of 
what um, the Lord Chief Justice said was that one should not compartmentalize, that the idea that lawyers have, and speaking of myself, I rather like having a little taxonomy, a, a list and a series of boxes with limbs and sublimbs into which I can neatly uh, partition um, everything in my legal life. Um, doesn't work for Article 2. It's not the way he said um, the European Court approached things. In paragraph 96 um, of his judgment, he said the question whether an operational duty under Article 2 was owed is not an abstract one, which delivers a yes or no answer in all circumstances. And in 97, the approach illuminated by the prison cases does not support a conclusion that for all purposes, an operational duty is owed to those in a vulnerable position as um, uh, both Sarah and Emma have said earlier. So um, what he was seeking to do was, I think, to uh, focus on the um, relevant facts that relate to death and whether or not the position in which the person was in before that time had a material impact on them. And in Jackie's case, he said no, um, that they focus on the dolls, the deprivation of liberty, was um, irrelevant, essentially. Um, that she didn't um, um, sadly die because she couldn't open the door. The deprivation of liberty um, order that prevented her from opening the door did not stop her accessing medical attention. And so there was no um, magic to the dolls in this case. Now, of course, it was argued, but you need to look at the reasons behind the dolls. Um, the, um, the reasons that the dolls was in place was because she needed medical um, care and attention. But that means that the dolls itself was largely irrelevant. Um, and so I can see that that approach being applied equally in um, psychiatric care cases, where one looks at the reason that they were in the regime that they were and the nature of the regime and actually ask the question does that make a difference did that make a difference was it material to um, how they came by their death and in many cases um, or at least a good proportion of cases i think the answer will probably be no and so this rather automatic if x then y approach that we've had to article two i think is on the decline Anyone else on that? Um, well, I, I the only only um, only only point that occurred to me when you were speaking, Jason, was just that um, it, 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 you're, I completely agree about the relevance of dolls, and I guess one of the things to bear in mind um, in relation to that is the fact that you can be have learning disability and, and be in a care home and not be under a dolls order, but still be quite be highly vulnerable and still have problems with communication so you're right it's not a sort of a straightforward formula unfortunately and um yeah again you could you could have a similar case um where a family would art argue that article two applies for someone who was not under a doll's order but but was in a care home and did have learning disability okay um i, mean, I think we've um reached or nearly reached um we have reached um the end of our time uh, today um Unless there was anything else um, Sarah or Emma wanted to add, I was going to um, bring proceedings to a close. Nothing Good. more for me. Nor me. Thanks, Sarah. Well, um, thank you very much, um, everyone, for joining us. As I said, um, uh, please do um, sign up for the um, uh, Inquest and Inquiries newsletter. It's packed full of useful information. Just getting in touch with George Connor our marketing and director, marketing manager, and she will oblige. Thanks very much and cheerio. Thank you.